All right, again, welcome everyone to our A to J Author new user training. Today, um, just a couple of reminders before we get started that you're all on mute. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand or put those questions in the question box. If you uh, don't have a microphone, make sure to put any comments in that question box as well. If you're calling in by phone today, make sure to enter your audio pin to be heard. And this session is being recorded and might be posted on a to J -Author .org. So our topic today is Back to Basics, the question design. And on our agenda today is um, a couple of things. First, we're going to talk about creating a new question in A to J Author. Then we're going to talk about the tabs, um, three specifically, the question tab, the fields tab, and the buttons tab. And then we have a special guest with us today, Carolyn Robinson, who's the website project coordinator for Mass Legal Help. She's going to talk a little bit about best practices for drafting the actual questions themselves. Then a little bit about additional resources and questions at the end. So today we have a different format. Um, instead of just the PowerPoint and then going into A to J Author, I have a split screen. Um, and as we talk about the different um, things in the PowerPoint, I'll have some screenshots, but we can also do them live in A to J Author. So the first thing to talk about is creating new questions. This is really back to basics, very simply, how do I make a new question? So when you open up A to J Author, which I have um, on the right of the screen, um, these are the four questions, the four default questions that come with A to J Author. Um, if I want to create a new question, I simply let me get rid of my highlighter here. I simply click the Add button, and a new question pops up. With A to J Author, whatever the last question you were on is the one that it duplicates. So if you're in step uh, zero or step one here, if you're in step zero, you hit that button, it creates another question in step zero. Um, so let's open up one of these questions. So let's open up this one. Um, this is the question design window, the whole thing. Um, and uh, on the question design window, we have four different tabs. It, A to J author defaults to the question tab when you open up the question design window. But there's also the Fields tab, the Buttons tab, and the Advanced tab. Um, a little bit more about the Question tab. So this one has a lot of stuff going on in it. We have um, the step, the question step, and the name of the question. We have the question text. We have the Learn More section. We have the Learn More Answer section. We have the thumbnail on the right. This is what the end user sees. We have the audio add-ins, um, embolden, italicize, hyperlink, PowerPoint. We're all going to talk about these a little bit more. Um, but this is just a broad overview of what is even on the question tab. You can also always look at the XML code. You can always go to preview to see what the end user sees. To get back out of preview, just hit resume edit. And you can always close the question to go back to your question list. So let's break down the question tab a little bit further. Um, on the, at the top, we have the step name and the question name. Um, the step name and the question name, the step number and the question name is what you see when you look at A to J author um, in the question list. So we have step, the number in parentheses, and then the name of the question. Uh, a to J author organizes questions um, in the question list by the step number and then alphanumerically. So a tip, start every name of the question here with, um, with a number and then name it. If you don't put a number in it, A to J author is going to organize your list here in alphabetical order after the step name. So your questions can get confusing. You might not know what order they're in. Um, and they won't necessarily flow correctly. It'll be hard to find them. Now remember, the way that your um, questions are organized in your question list is not necessarily the same way that your end user will see them. The way your end user is going to see them is how you connect them. And how you connect them can be seen through the flow chart. So it's important to know that if you change the order here, it doesn't necessarily change the order of how your end user sees it. And vice versa, if you change, if you move a question around, and connected differently, that's not going to change how your question list shows up. So a little bit more about the question tab itself. You can um, embolden, 
whatever word is highlighted. That's a question. You can italicize it. You can hyperlink to something else. Say I wanted to hyperlink to um, A to J author. And then in the preview, you'll see that it takes us right to A to J author .org. You can also add a pop-up if I wanted. Uh, Pop-ups are good for definitions. So you have a, a word that someone might not understand, one of your pro se litigants might not understand. Add a definitional pop-up. And within that pop-up, you can embolden, italicize, and hyperlink again. Add text. You can add audio to it. It really helps you expand what you can do for your uh, end user. We also have the learn more question section and the learn more answer section. Again, embolden, italicize, hyperlink, uh, and pop-up. Um, within both the question text, the pop-up, and the learn more, you can include audio. So this little file here lets you browse. Let's browse for some sample music. I add it. This little play button, now it's going to play. It's going to show you, or you can hear what clip you actually have in there. So basically you can test to make sure you have, you've grabbed the correct clip. And you can add audio to, to um, any of the sections. Another cool thing for the learn more section is you can add text, you can add show me graphics, or you can sh add show me video. So say you want to include um, a section of it asking um, to sign something or to where to find information. In the show me graphic, you can um, go and browse your files, find a picture of um, whatever it is, a form, add the picture in, and then when you're in the learn more section, the audio pops up automatically. You're in the learn more section, you can see the picture. So you could have the form and where on the form the information will be located for your end user. A note about um, the graphics and the video, the graphics have to be in JPEG, PNG, or .gif files, and the videos have to be flash videos, so it's a .flv um, ending there. So moving off the question uh, tab, we have the fields tab. And with the fields tab, um, in the screenshot here, you can see that there's a lot going on in the fields tab as well. We have field type, field label, the variable, the require the question or not require the question, the prompt if you do require the question, the list of fields that you have in there, and the add and delete button. Just like with the questions, whatever the last field you're on is the one that will duplicate. Okay, field templates. These are awesome. Don't reinvent the wheel when you're trying to make these questions. Here's a blank one. It doesn't have any fields. Click Browse to find our templates. There's 18 A to J author templates available. Use them. Don't, every time you want to gather their information about an address, don't bother creating six different fields. Use the A to J author one and customize it. So perhaps your, um, your form doesn't require the county. You can always delete the county. You can also add in something else. Whatever it is you want to do to customize it, at least use the templates as a jumping off point. They're very helpful um, in those terms. Let me just fix this a little bit. I see a question that you guys can see my control panel. So I am going to move it over a little bit move it down here. Okay, so getting back to this, uh, a tip for when you're using the templates, um, remember to rename your variables with your own naming convention. So A to J author um, defaults to client as the name. You might not be using client as your um, preferred naming convention. You may use, be using um, user, defendant, whatever you're using, make sure you have the correct naming convention and that your variables match. So you have to go through each one of these and check to make sure that your variables match up. It's very important for your end document. So what are the different field types? If we go out of this, pick a new question. 
blank field. Um, I don't, you don't want to use one of the templates. That's fine. Just pick, add a field. And the fields are the format that the answer is going to be shown to the end user. There's six basic types of fields. There's text, number, date, gender fields, radio buttons, and check boxes. So um, for these, you can see that while there's six basic types, there's different options. Text, long, pick from a list, different kinds of numbers, the date, the gender, the radio boxes, and the check boxes, including none of the above. So let's pick one. Um, the fields tab um, explain. So the label, we have the type. We know what type it is. It's a number, and I'm going to ask for a dollar sign. So the dollar symbol will pop up. A label is what is going to appear before the, um, the question text itself. So um, here in the little thumbnail, we can see what the end user is going to see. So change the name of it to income, perhaps. And it's live, it's real time. So as you change it in the question design window, it's changing it in the thumbnail as well. You can assign default variables for certain things. So in the screenshot, um, you can see that perhaps you want to auto fill in your state or county for your end user. You can create a default value that does that. Um, you can also limit value ranges. So uh, income, I don't want anyone with an income less than hundred dollars or anyone with an income over ten thousand dollars so this will limit what is shown in the um, or what is available to be input there I can always add a calculator to allow the end user if they need to add things up I can require that it, that the um, user answer the question or I can let them leave a blank if I require them to fill it in we have the prompt that will show up. You must type a dollar amount in the highlighted space before you can continue. If I, um, if you, if you as the author want to change the prompt, feel free. You can also add audio the same way you do in the question itself. And um, if it were a list, text pick from a list, you can order the list either ascending or descending. Moving on to the buttons tab. We have um, a little bit about it explained. So we have the button label. We have the button list, the list of the buttons. Add or delete, same as with um, the field on us picking a question. We can assign a variable a value, and um, we can do repeat loop options. So getting to know the buttons tab a little bit. What do buttons do? So you can basically use buttons instead of fields when you only have three options or less. Um, you, by default, get only a continue button with every question. The maximum number of buttons is three. So if you try to add more than three, the add button just goes away. And you can label the buttons whatever you'd like. They don't have to just be continue, yes or no, simple ones. They can be long. In the screen grab here, if you have children, yes, no, or there's a button, we're pregnant. So it's very customizable for those shorter questions. And what can a button do? You can assign a value to a variable. Um, you can go to another question. That's kind of the main use of a button. And you can set or increment a counting variable. So same with labels. You can change the label. It's showing up on the right here as yes. This one, you can change the label to no. Any way you want to do it. You can, um, after the, the user say um, the question was, are you pregnant? Yes, no, we're, um, we're expecting. Or are you, do you have children? Yes, no, we're pregnant. With the no, you can set, create a variable. Um, Client, pregnant, true, false. You can set that variable based on their answer to the question, are you pregnant, to false. Um, destination question, you can tell it where to go. From the destination question, you click the little folder, and it'll open up your option of destination questions. It'll have all the questions you created, plus back to the prior question, the success process form, exit the user doesn't qualify, or the exit and the resume interview. Um, both of those are for the save and exit feature in A to J Author. 
looks like SAS passed this form is the last button you should use in, a, in an interview. And it takes them to, um, if you're hosting an LHI server, to LHI where they can get their document. Um, the last tab in the question design menu, uh, window is the advanced tab. This we're going to save for another day. It's a little beyond just the basics of question design. There are tutorials on a to jauthor.org if you're stuck on this, and we will be doing a future training on it as well, so look out for that. But just the basics of the advanced tab. You use the advanced tab to either branch to a specific question based on the user's answer or to set the value of a variable based on that user's answers as well. You have simple if statements, so if true, after the user pushes the button, some condition, and you have an action. So if true, you can set the variable to a value, and you can tell what the variable is, what variable you want to set, and what value you want to set it to. Or you can branch them specifically to a, set, a different set of questions. So it allows you to do a lot more advanced logic. So next, I'm going to um, open this up for uh, Carolyn. And she's going to take over. I will unmute her. And um, we'll talk a little bit about overall design of questions, the templates, the order of questions, individual questions. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit about plain language, readability, and questions to ask yourself. So I'm going to blow this one up and put it into slideshow mode. Um, and I will unmute Carolyn. Carolyn, can you hear us? We're good. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So okay. if you want, I can All just right. click through the different sections. Let me know when you're ready to go. Okay. Uh, we're going to just wing this. I had wanted to put together a bunch of um, uh, images or, you know, screen grabs from A to J so you could see just the, just the way Jessica was showing you. But um, we'll see what we can do here. So. I, I, what I, th these are what I've sort of pulled together from what I do and from talking to other people what they do. And then so I, sat, so I had a little bit more credibility. I went and looked at um, some research, various schools of communication like London School of Economics and uh, University of Colorado have communication schools. And they're, they're talking a little bit about questions and surveys, but I think a lot of the survey question principles apply to these A to J. Um, A to J interviews. So the idea is the short and meaningful title. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> is um, I guess it's self-explanatory, so that people feel like they're they're clear about where they want to where they want to go. Um, when we talk about your audience and goal in mind, I think everything you're talking about, everything you're thinking, if you're here at A to J thinking about it, you 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 recognize. Um, the grade, the reading grade level of the people that we're aiming for, and this idea of keeping your goal in mind also helps you structure how you group your questions. So I'm just jumping down to there. Um, I think you've probably already seen you, when you do when you create your questions in A to J, you can create those steps. So the so the idea of the steps helps you think about how you cluster the same things together. Sometimes, if you're doing more than one form, um, a lot of a lot of this thinking for me came out um, of the project that we're doing for child support in Massachusetts, um, where we have uh, financial statements, child support guidelines worksheet, the complaint itself, whether it's a modification or a complaint to establish or complaint for contempt. Uh, users need all of these forms together. Obviously, the advantages of A to J uh, is that you don't ask the person their name and their address and all their contact details over and over again. But then within these certain forms, you ask, you, they, they have, share, they have uh, information that they all share that they need. Um, and there isn't any reason that you have to go through a form question by question by question. So for example, the child support guidelines worksheets there are questions about child care, health insurance, uh, dental and visual uh, vision insurance. Equally, on the financial statement, you also have those questions. So rather than asking, when you're thinking about this, rather than asking all of the uh, guidelines, maybe I should just pull this up. Rather than asking all of the guidelines um, 
questions together, and then asking all of the um, child's uh, financial statement questions together. You ask them once, and then they go to the different forms. So this is our financial statement. These are um, expenses. And then let's see if I can quickly pull up the Child Support Guidelines worksheet. I don't think I can share my screen with you, Carolyn, in the webinar. I think that's just oh. in meetings. Oh, okay. So this is all, all right. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So I was the, looking at right, fine. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so the idea is that um, if you have different forms, don't you don't let the forms dictate how you group the questions. I think that's I think that's the important part. Think about how you're how having the questions that are similar on the forms should go together. Um, so that's that's my big thing about grouping questions. And then and then we um, Jessica talked about bold. Uh, I think I'm going to skip some of this. And then, obviously, when you're asking questions, what I do is I take little pictures of the forms. The, our interview is quite long. You're going to try and make it as short as you can, but um, as long as people know where they are and they feel like they're getting through, I think that they they uh, they recognize that if they sit down and do these paper, these forms by themselves, um, they take a lot longer on paper. So the so so you have to think about. Um, Getting through the, getting through the form. Sorry, I'm totally lost. So, do you with <laughs> your when you said you take pictures of the form, the actual form that you're automating, or of something yeah, else well, like find the information you need here? No, it's the form. So, in other words, I take a screenshot. I say our complaint for modification is three sections, mm -hmm. and we um, we ask people how their what, how the how the circumstances have changed, and we ask very focused, direct questions about how the circumstances have changed, and then we feed that back to people. Um, when when we're asking that that those series of questions, there's a screen grab, not of the when I say the form I'm automating, we take a picture of the PDF, okay, and a section of it, and we say this is this is where it's going to go on the form. Oh, that's so really that people, interesting. They can sort of see how they're progressing through the form and where and where it goes. And I think it gives people a sense of, you know, this is re it's not it's not it's not like a TurboTax, you know, where you can flip in and out and see how far you've gotten on the form within what within one medium being your A to J interview. But it but it's just a little screen grab that says, here's a space where your answers will go. And I think that's particularly helpful. In um, in complaints where you have sec sections of text, you know, if you're just checking boxes or you're putting numbers in for the expenses and things, that's a little bit different. But where you have three or four lines of text in a complaint or in an answer, um, people get a sense of, you know, what 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 are, what am I actually doing? I'm I've been not in here for 20 minutes. Where where is all this going to go? I like um, that idea. We get a lot of discussion about. Um, how to show people how far they are through the interview, and that's kind of the whole idea of our steps. But we get some feedback of, you know, it should have a 50% done or a, you know, you're 10% done. But if they can see on the form, you know, where they are on it, I think that really helps. Yeah. Them. I think that's part of the grouping thing, because what I try to do is we have just incredibly long um, interviews because we're trying to do seven or eight forms at once, and they're and they're pretty complicated. So. We do um, an outline in the in the beginning of the interview um, that says these are the forms we're going to be working on, and then when we get to a certain point, we say, okay, you finished this form, you finished answering the questions for this form. Now we're moving on to this form. Sometimes you jump around back and forth, and you do that in the steps. Um, but I think I think that's that's helpful to people so that they they can see they can have a sense. You can't really do that 50% because it really depends on people's answers, where, yeah. they, where they are. But I think if you let people know, okay, we finished this form, now we're moving on to that form, or for the Child Support Guidelines Worksheet, we ask you a whole lot of questions that end up going on the financial statement. But we say, okay, you've answered all the questions about your 
expenses and income for the worksheet. Now we're going to ask about the other parents' expenses. So people, I think that's, I th and I think you're doing that with the questions. That's a way of grouping, another way of thinking about grouping the questions. Yeah. Um, and then the, and the other thing with this overall design, um, we've been talking about it, I think, around is developing templates for your interviews so that you don't have to rethink this every time you do a new interview. And, and the idea for all of your interviews, I think um, people are in general agreement, is that at the beginning you want to know whether people um, qualify or are eligible. Um, you also, we've, we've, in Massachusetts, we think what we need to do is give people within the interview even still a, sent, uh, a way to refresh how to use the interview. So I have a screen where, you know, it says click the, click the words that are underlined in red, click the learn more, click the blue, click the blue links. Just try these out a little bit. So people can go there if they want to, they don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, at the, another thing that you want at the beginning of the interview is um, people need to know before they get too far in if, they're, if they need anything ahead of time. Oh, here we've got to, so they order the questions. So beginning of the interview, checklist of things users need. Um, instructions how to use the interview. Now that's a side, you don't have to go there. You know, when you do your buttons at the bottom, uh, that gives you the option to go to the question about, that explains the interview or skip it. So I don't think people have to go through that. Uh, um, and and uh, the other thing is about qualifications and eligibility. If uh, if somebody is going to get kicked out, you don't want them to have spent 15 minutes um, uh, finding, you know, answering questions and then say, oh, sorry, you're not really a parent, or oh, sorry, you've been working on this for 45 minutes, we've just discovered you're not eligible financially, you've got to leave. So those are the kind of things that you want to have in the beginning. And then the other thing that I try to figure out how to get in, it's all, it's all a balance, you have to play around with all these things, is I try to ask a question that's not too sensitive, but um, but will grab people from the very beginning. So it's not all about my little avatar asking all these questions about what's your name, where do you live, what's your address. One of the first questions I ask in the modification is, how do you want to modify? Do you want to change the amount? Do you want to change? And so people. I think it makes people, it, we use that information further on, but if you ask a little bit of a question in the beginning that is actually related to the complaint or what they want to do, I think that kind of makes people feel like they're not just answering all of this, you know, extraneous unimportance to them. It's not part of their issue, in other words, their name and all those things. So if you, if you find out what they want to do with a question and they answer it, uh, very close to the beginning. My theory is that um, you'll hold on to them a little bit longer. Okay, so then this idea of sensitive questions. Again, you do ask a, fa a fair amount of these sort of boring your name and address questions, and then gradually um, you, you, you work up to the more sensitive questions. I think people are, you think they're in the flow of um, of answering the questions. So one of the things um, that, uh, and then, let's see, so there's that, and then there's also um, these sensitive questions, there's this issue of, uh, of having it be an advocacy, oh, we got this opportunity for advocacy issue, so I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I, think you, you, I think you need to be sensitive when you ask questions, or we need to be sensitive when we ask questions about how, how we ask it. So uh, one of the things we can do is say somebody, um, say somebody's doing an answer to a complaint uh, for contempt for paying child support. There, there are ways to ask that, that question um, that may not be quite so blatant. So you could say, um, the Department of Revenue reports that 53 parents are behind in paying child support. Um, are you, are you behind in paying child support? So, so, so despite the fact that we try to use shorter sentences, sometimes you want to embed it in a longer sentence or a context where people feel safer answering it. 
Um, I like that idea. It doesn't imply any judgment necessarily. So they, right. they might be behind in their child support, but they could have a very legitimate reason for it. So ask it in a way that acknowledges that they're, you know, without criticizing. Yeah. Um, and there are things like, a way, another way to say is, have you had a series of setbacks um, so that you could not pay child support? So then you're, you're on their side, you're empathizing with them. Um, one of the disadvantages of the, not A to, not a to J itself, but when you do the, any kind of automation, like when you're asking these um, questions, when a computer is asking these questions and you want to think, um, you want to be intelligent about it, almost very, and let's see, not almost all the time, but very often people might want to qualify. So um, you might say, are you behind in your child support um, because of X, Y, or Z? And, 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 and your X, Y, and Z hasn't answered it. So for example, uh, my income, say my income has gone down. Well, and then we say, well, why has your income gone down? And um, I actually have a, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I have a list. So we say, um, I was ill. My hours were cut, I got laid off, I got fired, I was in prison. And you're seeing the same, um, or, and then you put other. So that if somebody clicks other, then they can talk a little bit about it. So I think that's one of the things we want to be able to do that you, can, that you can do on paper. You can scribble in the margin, or you can add something extra. And we want to find ways where um, people can, cannot, can, can pick something other than what our specific answers are. Again, that depends on the question. Um, my example about decreasing income, my income going down, again, is this idea of leading people up. So people might be hesitant to say, I was in prison. And the experts, I, I didn't really think about this, but the experts say, even when you give people a list of answers, as if, there, if some of those answers are more sensitive than others, you put those to the bottom of the list. Um, oh, here we go. Ask for an answer on only. Okay, so this is the um, uh, when you ask for an answer on only one dimension. That's I think that's um, it's probably fairly obvious when you're doing the A to J questions. But I've seen some things come up lately where people get a little bit confused. You, the forms are trying to. If you think about paper forms, are trying to save space and. Um, they, they, they will ask one question that is, um, it's actually seven or eight questions. And so what we need to do is break it down into one question at a time. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you an example of our um, complaint for contempt, which you would never want to ask in A to J. But it's a, an example of the kind of how you would break it down into, I'm just going to have a quick, I won't be able to show it to you, but I just want to find it so I can read it because it's just unbelievable that this is um, complaint for contempt. So what you don't want to do is take the questions from the form and just stick them into A to J. And here, here's a perfect example of, um, oh wait, is it not? Sorry, it wasn't wrong form. It wasn't contempt. It was, um, it's, uh, oh shoot, I'll find it. Life support, is it this one? Unmarried. Here it is. Okay, so here, so essentially, if you if you're going to do an A to J, straight A to J of this form, you would say, was the mother of the child not married at the time of the child's birth and not married within 300 days before the birth of the child? Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> that's more than one I question. Just think I that's guess. hysterical. <laughs> And I think that what we're trying to do with, it, that with the whole A to J technology is take forms like that, forms that have questions like that, and break them down into, into questions that people can actually answer, and then also do some of the backs behind the scenes things. So you can ask people about the date the child was born, if the mother was married, when the mother was married, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a perfect example of breaking these, this ask for an answer on only one dimension. I think that's got about five dimensions in it, plus it's got some complicated <laughs> math in there.
Um, I said it's the, uh, the I don't know is really important. Uh, when we have things like uh, mortgages, ask people of um, the balance on their mortgage. There are a lot of people who say it's a domestic violence or some other divorce where one spouse was, took care of all the finances and the other spouse really doesn't know and doesn't have a way to find out. So, we're, so I think that's important to leave that in there. Uh, the no ambiguity, again, is when you ask the question, make sure, as, as well as you can, that people actually understand um, the question. We have, a, we have another question on our financial statement that asks for um, depletion as an expense. Well, I don't think anybody actually knows what depletion is. And I went to the IRS website, and depletion has something to do with owning land and the natural resources being depleted. But I, I talked to court staff. Nobody knows what depletion is. <laughs> so I think it's something that you really need to explain or figure out how to leave out. Um, in the earlier slide, we I, I make, hopefully I'm going to come back to this whole idea, is that my big theme is that working on, these, working on the, uh, the A to J and the document assembly is really an opportunity um, to improve access to justice because the forms are not always well thought out or people are rushed when they do it or they haven't tested them. And I think the better we can make forms both through uh, the automated uh, document assembly pro projects and working with the courts, whether your legal services working with court staff or court staff working with legal services, I think it really helps us think about what are we asking, do we need that information, what are we going to do with that information? And um, do people understand what we're asking? Um, so again, this depletion, I think, is assuming what the user knows. I had some other examples of that, but I, I can't think of it at the minute. I think um, we, Carolyn and I talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, some of the things also with you know fixing the forms by making better A to J's is think about whether you need that social social security number think about whether yeah. the court needs that social security number how easy it is for identity theft or somebody's doing this in the library computer and they save it to the to the library's computer instead of printing it or just all the information well, and some of that's interesting because there's a question in Massachusetts right now whether it's even legal for the court to ask for the social security number. Oh, wow. So, so the way we've dealt with that is we, it's a, it's a, it's a big legal question, and it's not something that we can tackle in our project. But it's raised awareness in the in the court and in the legal services. So the way we deal with that is we ask for people's social security number. It's not required. At the same time, we don't have a learn more. We sort of made us. I don't know what you call it, a strategic question, uh, decision, not to put a learn more saying, you don't have to put your social security number <laughs> in here. Because we, we, we do want to work with the courts. We don't want to point things out. We don't, it, and I think that I, that's a kind of you know, big, bigger question um, that I think is fascinating and to see how we do it. But there, there will be things like that. And again, with the birth date, we don't have a learn more. Again, it's not required. Um, I think the forms, sometimes the paper forms or the court does require some of these forms. But since we, you know, maybe it's maybe e-filing will come into this. But at the minute, we're still filing these with the clerk. And I think where it's safer for people not to answer questions or where they're really uncomfortable with it, it's we shouldn't require answers to everything. And then if the clerk, when they file these forms, has an issue with it, uh, then then they can fill it in then if they need to. But that's up, that's up to the court. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I and I and I think that's something you learn from once you once you're filing and then you see with your court staff whether these whether, what's coming up again and again that'll help you deal with it. Um, Okay, so questions should not rely on previous answers. That's for example, if you're saying this is a really easy example, if somebody has. Uh, a number of expenses. A to J handles this really nicely so that you say, okay, so you spend $25 a week on goat grain. Um, is, there, is there anything else that you spend money on? And you can say, in addition to goat grain, in addition to goat grain and chocolate, in addition to goat grain, chocolate, and good and plenties, 
what else do you spend money on? And that reminds people what they've, how they've already answered it, and it also validates what they've said. So they have the chance to think, oh, I didn't mean that. I can go back and change that. Yeah, that's um, what you can use in those when you've set variables, and then you can go back and create variable macros using that information. Okay, and then um, Jessica, you were going to talk about the. Well, you were talking to talk about these last two questions, right? Leading yeah. language and. Yeah, I have um, the next slide on here is actually kind of plain language readability, and it refers back um, to that one. So think about the language you're using. We teach a class here um, at Chicago Kent for our students where they actually help create these A to J guided interviews. And one of the big topics is plain language readability. The audience we're shooting for, the level for the audience that we're shooting for is fifth grade. Um, studies have shown that there are millions of people, even with high school um, diplomas, who aren't at that fifth grade level yet. So really write for your audience. Consider their age, uh, consider their education, their culture, the language of the reader. Use words that they're familiar with. Um, use phrases they're familiar with. And if you have to use something like a specialized term or um, an archaic term that you know the average person isn't familiar with, use that pop-up. Um, give them that definition. Explain it further to them. You want to always use um, the active voice and direct address. Um, and Carolyn mentioned before, sometimes, like, the point is to boil it down, to get, you know, short questions. So omit the unnecessary detail, except maybe um, when you're trying to couch a sensitive issue um, in a longer phrase. And there's a really cool thing that, um, I didn't even know about this one, but Carolyn uh, suggested it yesterday. So um, writeclearly.org has a plain language online course. And so I checked it out yesterday, and they have, um, this is the writeclearly.org's website, and they have three lessons. So if they're free to use, so just click on the lesson, and it opens up a Cali lesson. Cali is actually the sister program of A to J Author. The same people who write A to, um, A to J Author software make the Cali Author software. So a lot of it's very familiar to you guys. Um, and if you, you can just go through the lessons, it, um, question and answer, and it teaches you how to think about plain language and how to create plain language um, documents. So there's also the questions to ask yourself when you're making a guided interview. Um, what Carolyn talked about, what topics should you start off with? What, what's that checklist that the user is going to need? What are they going to need? Um, you know, their tax information. Are they going to need addresses? Are they, like, get a list of all the stuff you think an, uh, an end user is going to need before they start answering those questions. Create that checklist for them. Think about whether the questions move logically from one uh, to the next. Do topics lead up to one another? And is my guided interview in plain language? Um, Carolyn, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Um, I was, uh, the, the two things I want to say is one is that the question thing I had an example is I didn't realize this in terms of how questions relate to each other, but I had a question saying, how many children do you have? And the question after that is, what, um, what's, the fa what's the name of your children's father? And to everybody who even looked at that, they, they put in the name they, of their child. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was incredible, and that, that, that was one of the things that got, got me started thinking about this, um, and, I, and I, think that, I, I think that's the kind of thing you don't, you don't even, you don't realize until you start asking yourself this question, and of course you want to test this on everybody. And the other thing I just wanted to say is on that writeclearly.org website, on the, at the bottom of the home page, on the Write Clearly gadget, um, I haven't used it yet. But there's, um, there's an, uh, they've just re, redone the gadget. And if you go, it's at the very oh, bottom right oh, okay. of the page. It's, I think it's waiting. It's, it's, above the, it's above that video. It's waiting to load on okay. the screen. But there's a tab where I think you can put the A to J. Oh, OK. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> you don't have the plug in for it. But there's a, there's a tab where you can. Um, put in your A to J script 
and I guess it'll analyze your your A to J interview for plain language. Also, I haven't tried that out yet. That's really but, neat. But uh, yeah. that I just thought you'd want to know about that. It's like a cheat sheet for whether you've done plain language or not. Well, it catches things too. Um, it's 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 more than a cheat sheet. It it grades each sentence and. You can see you can you can see what's if you can't figure out which one is throwing your throwing your stuff off, you can it, it'll t it'll it's it highlights those sentences well not highlights but it gives them a score so you can see what's the what's the thing that's really difficult that's going to be difficult for people to understand or it'll highlight a particular word and give you uh, possible substitutions for it. That's interesting because when we were doing this. Um, you, you talked about high variabil variability versus low variability and words that um, mean different things to different people. So the, right. one of the suggestions was like most or a substantial ma majority. That means different things to different people. And I, I would never have thought that most would be um, something that, you know, would, would um, come up that might be an issue for people. And like just think uh, yeah, about the different words to use, like instead of most, um, just a majority of, or almost all, virtually all, that kind of thing. Right. There was some example of um, fairly, in so, it, 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 it has a colloquial meaning in, meaning in some place in Berea, Kentucky or something. That <laughs> it, it, it has a specific, it, it doesn't mean what you think it means when you stick it in the interview. Yeah. So, yeah, but those are, and I think those kinds of words, though, we probably wouldn't. I guess you really wouldn't be using in our context. I don't think, but it is something to think about. Yeah, um, I think those the lessons in the writeclearly.org will really help you if you're struggling with um, breaking it down, you know, to that fifth grade level. But um, before we go on to questions, just if you um, want to learn more about question design, we do have the a to j author.org, um, the authoring guide. There's other trainings and uh, presentations on it. We have our starter kit. We do have that um, writeclearly.org. It's not on here, but um, go check that out. Uh, upcoming trainings, next, they're the first Thursday of every month for new users and every other month for advanced users. Um, we're going to be doing something a little bit different for the next two advanced user forums. We might have a little preview, talk with John Mayer, um, our designer of A to J Author 5.0. So look forward to that one. And are there any questions? Um, if there are, just raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, any questions for Carolyn or about question design at all? I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Um, any questions? Carolyn, we have a pro here. She she really does a lot of these A to J guided interviews. So if you are new to it, please feel free to uh, to raise that question while you've got her here. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. So um, Carolyn, was there anything else? I think that's I think that's it. All right. Well, a big thank you to Carolyn for sharing her insights and um, her her tips, and a thank you to Callie for um, this go to meeting services. So um, thanks everyone, and we will see you next time.